Assalamualaikum everyone. Good evening. How was everyone's day? Good. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Kauthar, for welcoming me, and thank you all for having me um, tonight. My name is Aiden. Um, I was born and raised in the United States, but I, but I am ethnically Uyghur. Um, so, a quick show of hands: How many of you guys have heard of the Uyghurs before? Okay. How many of you guys had heard about the Uyghurs a year ago, or before a year ago? Okay. Okay, so I don't know if you guys saw the differences in the hands. Um, so in the past year, um, I mean, what have you guys heard about the situation in general? Like, what are some key words that came up? Yes. Um, just my personal opinion, what's going on in, in Western China about, regarding the Uyghurs and, and, and Xinjiang is the worst ethnic cleansing and genocide on the face of the planet right now. And um, a lot of other powerful countries that are not China, including the United States, have refused to step in like they did with Nazi Germany because of the amount of commercial ties to China that they have. Right. And yeah, it's just not acceptable and we need to stand up and thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else? General information? Yes. Um, like China's argument is that they're trying to re-educate the in an area to combat radicalism, which is kind of like they're just pulling everyone into radicalism and putting them in the future. Right. For re-education. Right. Okay, anyone else? Five years ago, did anyone know about this or have heard about the, the population? Okay, mashallah, a few people. Um, ten years ago. Well, we were probably like really young then, but... Um, okay. So the reason I'm asking that question is because I want to emphasize that this situation that I'm about to present to you today is something that is only recent uh, in the sense that it has only gotten worse in recent years. The oppression of the people of East Turkestan, which I, and I'll explain that term to you in a bit, has been going on for seven decades now since communist China came to power and, and, and had occupied the, the homeland of the Uyghurs and other Turkic, Turkic people. So this oppression is ongoing. Um, and it, it hasn't been until the construction of these concentration camps, which happened in 2016, that not until like two years later, then the media started to kind of explode. And notice how I say the word kind of, because even to this day, there are still many people who don't know about the situation. And the media coverage is still very, very, um, like, it, it's not comprehensive at all. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. Oh, sorry. This thing just got disconnected. Um, okay. All right, so before I begin this presentation, I want to give, give a couple disclaimers. Um, this presentation is pretty heavy with material. Um, a lot of it is very heavy information. There's uh, information on torture um, specifically. So if you ever feel uncomfortable, it feels too heavy, feel free to leave the room or turn your face. You don't have to look at all the slides. Um, and also another issue is that you may have heard that the region these people come from, the Uyghurs and other Turkic people living here, you may have heard it as the as Xinjiang, the Xinjiang region. Also, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you mind turning? Would it be possible to turn off the front lights just so it's easier to see? Um, so, so the nation that the Uyghurs and other Turkic people belong to is called East Turkestan. And the reason I say nation is because it is that. Um, the people of East Turkestan had lived with centuries of independence before formally being occupied most recently in 1949 when communist China came to power. And the reason we, I, I want to emphasize this point is because oftentimes in media you'll see the term Xinjiang being used. Um, and honestly, for most people of East Turkestan, that term is actually offensive. Um, and the reason it is offensive, and I'll give you an analogy, is imagine you're called something your whole life, right? You have an original name, and some kidnapper takes you and then renames you into something else, like new property or new human, right? And so, um, and, uh, and I mean, like, sorry, I lost my train of thought. And so they rename you. Um, into new property, into a language of their own. And then, you know, people who vouch for your release, who vouch for 
your freedom are then um, calling you as that name. So this, and this is part, um, also the renaming of the territory as Xinjiang, which actually in Chinese means new territory, is part of the attempt of trying to erase the people of East Turkestan and, and their, their true history in the past. So um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to be calling the nation East Turkestan. I encourage you all to use the same term and, not, and refrain from using the term Xinjiang. Okay. And this picture you see right here is actually, the source is actually coming from a, uh, an actual photo that I'll be showing you. And these are um, basically rows of Uyghur men who are, being, are in these concentration camps that you guys have been hearing of. And I'll, I'll show you guys the original photo in just a bit. So to begin, I'm going to give some overview of the population. Um, so China's report in 2015 said that the Uyghur population was 11.3 million. And that number in September of 2018 then became 6 to 7 million. So notice the decrease in that number. Estimates by Uyghur scholars for decades have estimated that this number is around 35 million, so, or 20 to 35 million, but many of the scholars say this is around 35 million. And so we're analyzing the situation, it's like why are these numbers so different? Why is there a discrepancy in these numbers? And we propose that this is part of China's attempt to wipe out the Uyghur through numbers and through paper. And so if you look at the map, you see China proper here, and East Turkestan on the northwest part. And if you look at the normal map, you'll see it written as Xinjiang. You'll never see uh, the term East Turkestan used. And you can also see Tibet and also Inner Mongolia in that photo as well. This is our national flag. Um, it's basically very, it's the exact same thing as a Turkish flag, but light blue. Um, and this flag right here, you'll never see in East Turkestan because if you have this flag, it will result in you being imprisoned or sentenced to death and shows your desire for an to reestablish the independent state of East Turkestan. So, and even the term East Turkestan itself is a crime, saying the term itself is a crime in the nation. So a lot of Uyghurs who are actually born and raised in the region and have never gone out, have never seen this flag, don't even know what their flags look, look like, don't know that we're in occupied territory and have never even heard the term East Turkestan or how we call it Sharq Turkestan. I believe in Arabic, Sharqi actually means uh, East. And so I want to emphasize that the people of East Turkestan are not just the Uyghur people. They, they comprise the majority of the Turkey people there. Um, but we want to also mention that there's also approximately 2 million, and these are just rough estimates of, of other Turkic Muslims, including Qazaks, Kyrgyz, Uzbeks, and also Tatars. And there's also a small number of Farsi-speaking Tajiks living in the region as well. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because the oppression isn't specifically targeted to the Uyghur people. It's targeted to all of these people as well. And I want to make sure not to exclude them out of the narrative. And I, I think that's a common mistake that, me, that the media and other activists say is like this is a hashtag Uyghur crisis. But it's much more than that. This is, this is a crackdown on an entire nation. Um, and this nation has been comprised of other ethnicities as well. And I, don't, uh, I forgot to mention before, but Uyghurs are a Turkic ethnic group. And so when, if you um, hear our language, it actually sounds a lot similar to the Uzbek and Kazakh language. And it's very, you can even see ties to the Turkish language as well. So one reason why China attempts to maintain such tight control over this region is because of natural resources. Um, so for example, in the region, it can produce 150 billion barrels in oil reserve a year. In the Totem Basin alone, 23.5 billion cubic meters of natural gas, and this is a report from 2017, 40% of China's coal, and even a fifth of the world's ketchup. So Heinz, the popular brand that we use to buy ketchup, is actually a, a big company that operates in this region. And we actually encourage people to, to boycott this company because of their... Um, their complicitness in this genocide. A lot of content is also grown in this region. Um, and because of this, this actually creates, uh, because of the exploitation of these resources and the fact that a lot of these resources are allocated to um, the Chinese government or to ethnic Han migrants who are coming to the region, that results in mass poverty of those living in the region as well. So I, don't, I didn't want to make this a history lesson, but I also figured that this 
the history is something that needs to be emphasized and at least mentioned in a presentation like this because the history is purposely left out of the Chinese government's narrative. Uh, people in East Turkestan will never even learn about the history unless it's through some underground, through, uh, through some secret uh, method. Um, but this, again, what you see on the screen is something that will, you, will, you won't be able to learn openly in China. And so I want to emphasize this to show how we have had independence, centuries of independence, um, before finally being occupied. And this is, again, another emphasis because, again, people don't know that we're in occupied territory. People say that Uyghurs are ethnic minorities, ethnic minorities of China, but that's part of the problem. Calling us ethnic minorities is actually a way to try to erase us as a nation, right? Um, so the people of East Turkestan lived with centuries of independence until the Manchus invaded East Turkestan in 17, 1759. Um, East Turkestan had also been a prominent center of commerce for more than 2,000 years. So Marco Polo actually, um, during his expedition, one of the last places he had arrived was a, a town in East Turkestan called Kashgar. And I'll show you guys pictures of it in just a little bit. This place, East Turkestan gave birth to many great civilizations, and at various points of history, it has been a cradle of scholarship, culture, and power. A lot of our major Islamic scholars from history actually come from the Bukhari or the East Turkestan region. And um, in 1884, when the Qing Dynasty was in power, it, East Turkestan was officially named, renamed as Xinjiang, which, and again, in Chinese means new territory or new colony. So the name itself implies that this is a land that was taken. The first Chinese invasion of East Turkestan took place in 1912, um, when the Manchu, after the Manchu Empire collapsed in 1911. And then after that, there were multiple Uyghur rebellions that eventually led to the first East Turkestan Islamic Republic in 1933. Shortly after this was collapsed um, uh, through Chinese forces and also through the help of the Soviet Union. And again, in 1944, a second East Turkestan Islamic Republic was established. This was only shortly lived for around five years. Um, and uh, when 19, in 1949, Communist China came to power and basically crushed all these forces and retook, um, kind of just, re just occupied all of East Turkestan. And since 1949, the people of East Turkestan has been undergoing uh, systematic forms of ethnic cleansing and genocide. So this is a picture of the declaration of the East Turkestan Islamic Republic um, in 1933 in the historic town of Kashgar. So as you can see, all these leaders are lined up here. All these leaders are also uh, eventually destroyed by the Chinese government through either killing them or imprisoning them nowhere to be seen again after. Then this is a picture of the, uh, this is one of the pictures from the establishment of the sec second East Turkestan Islamic Republic. Um, and through the help of the Soviet Union, they were able to crush this um, republic five years later. And in 1955, after communist China had already come to power, Beijing officially renamed the territory to Xinjiang Uyghur Autonom Autonomous Region. So if you look on the map or if you look on the term online, this is the official term that's used to name our territory. And if you look at the name itself, it's a little ironic because number one, I already explained to you guys why the term Xinjiang, using the term Xinjiang is problematic in that sense because again, it's acknowledging the fact that we're in occupied territory and, and it doesn't really shed light on the original name, which is East Turkestan. The term Uyghur, right? Right now, China's making so many attempts to erase everything that makes up the Uyghur culture, identity, the religion, and I'll show you guys just in just a bit on how exactly that's being done. Um, so the term Uyghur, I mean, it's, it's kind of, at this point, it's almost, it's being negated. Autonomous, it's right now, the region is nowhere near autonom autonomous, so, um, you guys are interested in. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the current situation. Right? Like, obviously, I, won't, I would love to kind of walk through uh, decade by decade with you all, but for the sake of time and because this is a lot of information, I'm going to kind of go straight to the point. But before getting to the point, I'm going to mention that you know, uh, the situation has escalated. Um, in the 1990s, you started to see crack China cracking down specifically on religion. Um, actually, no, I would say decades before, there was also a crackdown on religion. Um, in the 1950s, China had destroyed thousands and killed off thousands of our Uyghur intellectuals, leaders, scholars, religious scholars, 
um, in order to kind of wipe out any kind of Uyghur influence in society. Um, but most recently, in 2009, there was a, riot, there was a protest um, in July, uh, led by some peaceful Uyghur protesters, and this quickly became violent with the involvement of the Chinese police. Um, and this riot ended up uh, with thousands of arrests and deaths and disappearances. And from this moment on, China had vamped up its surveillance system to basically, um, oh sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting one point, very important point. There had, there had been a few terrorist attacks that had happened in China, either in the East Turkestan region or outside of that region. But China had used those terrorist attacks and, and, the, and, the, um, and the Urumqi uprising to basically claim that everyone of East Turkestan is prone to extremism. They're prone to terrorism, and therefore we have to take all the measures necessary to prevent this. That, is China's, that was China's excuse into putting people into camps. And, and, I'll, um, and, and again, so this was a gradual progression with time, right? So 2009, camps didn't exist. 2011, camps didn't exist. But you start to see the surveillance system get much more intense. Um, and people started to fleeing for their lives. The oppression started to already be intensely felt at, at that point. So this picture that you saw in the beginning, which was, which was the home page of the PowerPoint, I will show you guys the original photo. This is it. This is a photo posted on um, WeChat, which is uh, kind of China's main form of social media. Uh, Facebook and Twitter, you can't use it there, it's banned. So a lot of pe most people in China use this app. Um, this, this app is also used for like their Uber, um, even doing laundry services apparently, um, communicating with everything, everyone. But basically the government had posted this photo saying, this is what we're doing to keep you Chinese citizens safe from these dangerous Uyghurs. Look at what we're doing. We're actually taking, getting rid of terrorism through this method. So this picture is actually, again, released by the government. Um, no one had secretly took this photo and like posted it and leaked it online. Um, and this is a camp in Alup County, East Turkestan, in 2017, so around two years ago. And they had, and people in our community, in the diaspora community, had actually known some of these guys. And they said these people, and they had listed out their professions. One of them was an Islamic teacher. One of them was a bus driver. And they were saying these people aren't terrorists. So this is a uh, transcript from a recording of a Communist Chinese Party official who was trying to explain why these camps are, are existing in the first place. So I'm not going to read through all of it, um, but I'm gonna, the parts that I highlighted I'm going to read out loud just to show you guys uh, a little bit of the terminology that's been used to justify these concentration camps. So for example, uh, members of the public who have been chosen for re-education have been infected by an ideological illness. If we do not eradicate religious extremism at its roots, the violent terrorist incidents will grow and spread all over like an incurable malignant tumor. That is why they must be admitted to a re-education re hospital in time to treat and cleanse the virus from their brain and restore their normal mind. And this is all a comprehensive rescue mission to save them. That last part right there is uh, part of any colonial narrative that you hear where you come into a land, you take a people, you take a culture, you kill off a people in a culture for the sake of rescuing or developing them. So in these camps, uh, they, they're doing exactly what they say their goal is, which is to brainwash and, and to re-engineer these people. Right, so one of the things, so this is a picture of uh, Umar Bakali, who's a former Kazakh detainee who described his time in one of these camps. And he says, in these camps, they were forced uh, to be indoctrinated and forced to recite and memorize Chinese propaganda poetry. Before they got food, they had to thank President Xi. And they, had to force, uh, they were forced to chant phrases like, there is no such thing as religion, and religion is dangerous. And one of the um, other former camp survivors had mentioned that she was forced to say leniency for those who repent and punishment for those who resist. And in these camps, they were also told 
that they weren't allowed to speak their own mother tongue. So they had to speak Mandarin, even if you don't know Mandarin. You had to force yourself to somehow pull, some to, pull together some words to communicate what you're saying. So even amongst your inmates in the cells, you can't speak your mother tongue. So how did people find these re-education, quote-unquote, re-education camps in the first place? Um, so journalists cannot enter this region, region freely and just kind of document whatever they want and be like, oh, I need to like, you know, shed light on this oppression. So one way that we had uh, located or kind of figured out the extent of this, this crackdown has been through satellite imagery. So I'm going to show you guys something. This is a picture of one of the largest camps that have been found. This was actually found by a, um, a Chinese law student in Canada. His name is Sean, Sean Zhang. Um, so I'm actually going to show you guys really quick. Um, Sorry, one second. Through Google Earth, how you can find this. Um. Or what you would find when you put this into the longitude and latitude. Okay. I'm going to zoom out the world. Okay, just go ahead and put this in, see how it locates it. So this is the one I was just showing you guys. So you can see the construction of this detention camp. And this is actually in Dapanjang Urumqi, which in Urumqi is the capital of East Turkestan. So you can see on the left, these are, um, these are the police buildings, the administrative units, and to the right are all the detention facilities. And they say that this place can hold up to 10,000 prisoners or 10,000 detainees. So again, this is satellite imagery has been a way to locate all these camps and to predict how many people are actually detained in these detention facilities. And you can see here the, the size of the, you, the area is 519,397 square meters, and the perimeter is around 3,294 meters. So you can kind of imagine the scale of that size. This is a um, transformation photo of one facility that was that, that big in 2015, and three years later, the expansion of that facility to hold, up more, to hold more detainees. Here is a picture of a middle school um, that was transformed, in, transformed into a detention camp in one year. So you can see this is like the soccer field, and that's a school, and now that soccer field has turned into uh, detention facilities. So another um, recent uh, discovery has been that a lot, thousands of these detainees these prisoners have actually been transferred to parts of mainland China. And our theory is that this is part of their attempt to kind of dilute those who are being put into these camps and prisons. Because with the rise of international, uh, in, with the rise of, uh, international outcries and calling out China for what they're doing, people are like, okay, where are all the, peoples in, the where are the people in these camps? Um, you know, we're, we're proposing that a lot of them are now being transferred to mainland parts of China in order to not be seen and found. So there's one place in Gansu, which is part of main, it's a part in mainland China. It's a couple thousand miles away from, the, from East Turkestan. And this complex started being built in 2013 and could hold up to one, or more than one million people. So, um, and it's built so that if anyone were to escape this prison, by the time they reach civilization, or any kind of society, they would already be dead because it's like built in the middle of the desert. So I'm gonna show you guys a quick video on um, some leaked footage of the inside of these camps. And keep in mind that this footage was actually taken before people were actually put inside the camps. Um, and 
And I want to mention that um, the person who actually recorded this video actually ended up being punished for this video. Um, so and just to shed light on the way that exposing the issue can actually result in um, great punishment. The northern hillside of Yingyir Township in Yingying City, Xinjiang, was originally an open space and also served as a shooting range for militia training. Now, a transformation through education camp was built here. The camp is massive in size, containing four building complexes with a floor space area of about 110,000 square meters. The camp can accommodate several thousand people. According to a GPS image published by Sean Zhou, a Chinese student in Canada, a plot of land that was empty in mid-October of 2017 was covered in buildings by August of 2018. In August, our reporter penetrated the Yingyir transformation through education camp and photograph its interior constructions. Within the transformation through education camp, a complex of orange buildings lined up side by side holds dormitories for the camp's students. And upon closer inspection of the exteriors of the buildings in the complex, one can see that each building is four stories tall and that the windows of each floor are fitted with guard rail as well as an additional layer of guard netting. The exit areas of each building are fitted with three surveillance cameras apiece, which comprehensively monitor the area from the left, right, and center. A slogan is written on the external walls of the buildings, which reads, heartfelt thanks for the cordial care of the party central committee, with comrade Xi Jinping as the core. Inside the buildings, the interior constructions are just like the cells of a prison or detention center. Each room has double iron doors, and the outermost iron door also has guard railing and a keypad lock. Each dorm room has its own washroom and is fitted with a surveillance camera. According to a leak from an inside source, up to 15 people can live in each dorm. Surveying has also revealed that each floor holds 28 dorm rooms and three classrooms. Various slogans are written on the walls outside of the classrooms, such as, make a habit of studying Mandarin, and follow the guidance of Xi Jinping's thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, and untiringly strive to realize the China dream of a great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Besides, this floor of the building also contains a standalone surveillance room. From the large screen monitor, it is apparent that 360 degree surveillance cameras are installed in every corner of the building, including not only classrooms, dormitories, and corridors, but even washrooms. Every move by the detainees is monitored 24 hours a day they are totally deprived of freedom and privacy. The entirety of each building is stringently guarded, and in addition to surveillance cameras being installed in every corner, the entrance to the building has been fitted with an iron gate as well. In the corridors, the windows of each room have also been sealed with tight iron bars and wire netting. And even the windows in the room that may be used as the student cafeteria are no exception. It is nearly impossible for the people being held in these buildings to escape. Our reporter also noticed that there are several areas surrounded by chain link fencing on empty land in front of certain buildings, next to which large quantities of wire netting that hasn't yet been used is stacked in piles. On one side of the fencing, the words emergency asylum are written. According to an inside source from the public security system, this emergency asylum is most likely an outside walking area for detainees. An outside walking area is a place in the courtyard of a prison, where the prison allows its inmates to go to get some exercise at set times. 
The Chinese Communist Party, CCP authorities, have been desperately denying the existence of transformation through education camps. But recently, facing the international community's constant condemnation, the CCP authorities have withdrawn their previous statement and attempted to justify their persecution on Uyghurs, claiming that they are vocational training centers. The Inyeyer Transformation Through Education Camp has been advertised to the outside world as a vocational training school, though there is no difference between its inner constructions and those of a prison. So one thing I want to mention is that, so we had shown this, I had shown this video to one of the concentration camp survivors, um, now residing in Virginia, sorry, I don't know why this is, now residing in Virginia, and she told me this camp that she saw in this video is like 10 times better than the one that she was in. Um, she was cramped in a cell of 68 other women, um, forced to sleep on her sides, and they had to take turns sleeping. And uh, she said this is one of the best ones that she had seen. So, uh, okay. okay. So I'm not going to read this slide. I mean, it's kind of just a recap of what this video had just mentioned. Um, but essentially, the argument is that these camps are not like camps or uh, classrooms necessarily there are more like prisons a lot of these people cannot leave these facilities um, at all and they're actually being separated from their children and, and from their families so obviously with all of this happening you have millions of families that are torn apart including my own so uh, these are some pictures of my family members that have been affected by this directly so this um, gentleman on the far left his name is Eddie Jun, and he is my, my father's right next to him. My, this is my father's brother-in-law, so it's his sister's husband. And this is actually a picture of him in front of the White House. I kind of cropped out the White House just to focus on his face. But he had came to the United States in um, a few years ago to kind of just visit my relatives and visit my family, and also try to see if he could resettle in the States, um, to kind of see what jobs are out there. Things kind of didn't work out for him in the beginning. He was like, okay, I'm going to just go back for now. And upon his arrival back to East Turkestan, he had stopped in the to the Beijing International Airport. Upon his arrival, he was immediately detained with a black sack over his head. Um, his children, his, his uh, wife and children were actually waiting at the airport. He never came out. And since then, we've had no idea of where his whereabouts were. So and this was in, uh, this, I believe this was in 2017. And uh, so it's been around two years now since he's been missing. We know he's in a concentration camp in a town called Atush, but we don't know if he's alive or dead. And to this day, I mean, his wife is actually a judge. My aunt is actually a judge, and she actually tried to vouch for his release, and still um, we don't know. I mean, he hasn't been released, and we don't know his... Like, there, there's no communication between detainees and their families outside of these camps as well. This right here, I saw this is a really bad photo. You can't really see their faces. This is my aunt's husband. His name is Azat. His uh, brother, Parhat, had come to the United States to come to attend my cousin's wedding in 2014. And this is his daughter, um, Basilia, and she was actually a PE instructor, also a professional soccer player, and she was also sent to the camps um, and was, has been in there for over two years now. We don't know if she's alive or dead. Her father was also sent to the camps, this, this gentleman here that I mentioned, and about after a year after being in the camps, they had transferred him to a prison and sentenced him to 15 years of prison. For what crime? We don't know. Possibly, and one of the things that China criminalizes is going abroad, because they say that you going abroad potentially ties you to potential terrorist activity, and therefore you're a potential terrorist, and so here is your crime, they, they sentence them to these terms. This is a Human Rights Watch report, and um, they kind of gathered information on how someone could be sent to one of these concentration camps. And I'm not going to read through all of them, but you guys can kind of glimpse to see the extent of these acts that are then considered crimes. 
Um, I'll point out a few of them. So one of them could easily be you're praying, you're fasting, telling others not to swear, telling others not to sin, eating breakfast before the sun comes up. So like AKA eating your suhoor for fasting, right? Um, not having your government ID on your, on your, um, on your body, like on, with you, owning extra food, owning a tent, having a WhatsApp, wearing a full beard, having a VPN, wearing any clothes with religious icon, uh, iconography, wearing a shirt with Arabic lettered writing on it. There's another one here that's somewhere that says having, oh, inviting more than five people to your house without registering with the police department. Because they, they deem that having a, such a large gathering shows that you're like trying to plot something evil and like kill, go off and kill a bunch of people in the streets. Oh, having an Islamic uh, wedding ceremony, so the nikah ceremony is completely banned. So for people to even get married, there's no um, Islamically legitimate way to be married. Oh, even saying, the, even saying assalamu alaikum, which for those who don't know actually means peace be upon you and is the way that Muslims greet each other. That is also pr- uh, forbidden and can lead you to um, a prison sentencement of around 10 years. And in these camps, there has been reports of torture. Um, many of these reports are mainly coming from testimonies of those who have been released from detention or uh, these camps or prison. And they talked about how they were, um, you know, they had to face hunger. They were only fed a couple times a day, and all they were being fed is a steamed dough bun and some water. And sometimes they would just throw one for the entire cell, and they'd have to split up that one, that one bun amongst the detainees. Uh, there has been reports of rape and forced sterilization. And this is another way to get rid of the next generation of Uyghurs by, by promising and making sure that they cannot reproduce and, and have Uyghur children. So that Uyghur uh, sur- camp survivor that I mentioned to you before, I'll show her in just a little bit. She actually, once she came to the United States, the U.S. doctors actually told her she was sterilized because she can't have babies anymore. So she was actually one of the victims of forced sterilization. Uh, there has also been reports of organ harvesting. And the extent of this, we don't actually know the exact number. But there have been accounts coming out how these pres- healthy prisoners are taken into these camps and their organs are being just taken all out and, and sold off to this, this market um, where China then makes billions and billions of dollars from. Um, oftentimes these organs are taken out of the prisoners one, while, they're still, while, while they are still alive. And then there's also medical experimentation. Oftentimes these prisoners talk about how they're forced to take drugs that they don't, that they don't know of, they don't know what for. Um, and China claims that these are health, public health programs that they're trying to enact, but they're not being specific. And oftentimes these drugs cause mental derangement, so it literally causes them to lose their mind, or sometimes memory loss, and, or, and sometimes the ability to even feel emotion. So these people oftentimes forget that they even have family outside of these camps, and the fact that they have kids waiting for them at home. So they become like the walking dead in these camps. And then some, uh, one of the, a few of the DCNEs talked about how they were forced to sit on a tiger chair. This is a picture of a tiger chair. So you're basically clamped down on this chair. Um, one of the DCNEs who I, meant, who I showed you guys before, Omar Bakali, he was forced to sit on this chair for, um, for in, in solitary confinement for weeks on end in the dark. Uh, other DCNEs have talked about being electrically shocked. And then also uh, reports of death have been coming out. And oftentimes this is either through sickness, through uh, constant hunger and torture, and just being beaten to death. I'm going to give a, a couple moments just so you guys can process, because this is very heavy information again. And uh, I've realized when I move too fast, sometimes it gets a little overwhelming for the audience. So um, I'll move this side in the meantime. So this is evidence of, uh, some of the evidence of the organ harvesting that's um, known to be prevalent in the East Turkestan region. So this is actually a sign that was written in an airport saying that this is the route for organs. So they actually have a systematic place for people to move their organs, move prisoners' organs. And this was uh, found in the Kashgar airport, recently broadcasted by a Japanese TV station. And another way to humiliate these Muslims 
Um, oftentimes, actually, these detainees are not all Muslims, by the way. Some of them are actually, uh, they could be Christian, they could be of other faiths, sometimes they could even be atheists. But as long as your loyalty is not shown to the government and you show any sign of like potential trouble, you're put into these camps. But the media is still kind of generalizing and say that most of these people are Muslims, and they are generally Muslims. But in order to continue humiliating these people is by forcing them to drink alcohol and uh, consume pork. Um, and sometimes this is the only food that they're given in these facilities. This is the Uyghur sister that I was telling you guys about who um, uh, is one of the camp survivors. Um, so I will give a quick summary of her story. It's a little bit long, but I'm not gonna, I don't want to go into too, too much detail. But essentially, she was living in Egypt um, with her husband. She was living in Egypt to uh, get her master's in business administration. And she had met her husband there, she got married, and then she got pregnant with triplets. And when she gave birth to her triplets, she decided to go back to East Turkestan to have her mom help take care of her when she was, because these babies are newborn. Obviously, it's not really easy to take care of newborns when your husband's constantly at work. So she ends up going back to East Turkestan, and at this point, her babies are only a couple months old. And uh, upon her arrival, the Chinese authorities immediately detain her, take away her babies, and she's in detention for the first time. And then eventually they actually release her because they say her babies are in um, grave condition. They're actually very sick. One of them is specifically is in graver condition to the point where he's almost dying. So she goes to the hospital, uh, to the, the glass area. She sees her baby in the incubator. He's not moving. And they, the next day they bring the dead body of her baby to them. And they're like, oh, sorry, he just died. When, they, uh, when she asks why he died, they don't tell her an explanation. Um, and they actually, she actually finds out that they operate on all three of her triplets. And I met two of her kids, the surviving twins. They're actually three, four years old now. Um, they actually have a big slit on their throat um, from the operation for an operation that we don't know. Like, well, like we don't know why how, why they were operated on in the first place. So, in in the series of so in the series of a couple of years, she gets detained a total of three times. And she said her third detention was the worst in the period of. Three months of detention, she witnessed nine women in her cell die. And again, like I said, her, um, her cell was around, had around 60 or eight, 68 women. There's like a, two numbers kind of jumping around with that. But essentially, she talks about how they had to sleep in turns. They were forced to take, take pills that they didn't know. Um, and uh, essentially, a lot of these pills ended up st stopping women's menstruation, um, aka forced sterilization. And um, yeah, and then she talked about how they used psychological torture to also um, force her to confess that she was a terrorist. So they said that your mom, your dad, your brother, they're all in life in prison because of you. So if you don't tell us the truth about why you're in Egypt, and by the way, they're criminalizing her because she was in Egypt. They're like, what are you doing in Islamic country? What are you guys doing? What are you doing in Egypt? And so um, they used psychological torture in order for her to confess to things that she wasn't. Um, guilty of. And she asked them to kill her because of the torture. And this is one of the stories that she actually recounts about the woman in her cell. So she got to know these women in her cell during her time. And one of the women was actually a 23-year-old Uyghur woman who was sent to a camp because she went to a wedding that was considered like, like an Islamic like, I mean, they abided by a lot of Islamic customs, for example, no drinking alcohol, no dancing or singing. Right? Because of this, all 400 people who attended this wedding were all sent to the camp. And when she was detained, she had actually left two of her kids in the field. And from the, t the detainment onwards, she was agonizing about where her children were. And eventually that led to her to kind of faint. And the guards just took her away, and she was never to be seen again. Okay, and so what we had done is big, given her statistics of nine out of 68 women dying, um, we had calculated, used this number to calculate approximately how many, people, how, how many people would be dying if, let's say, the 1.5 million people in camps is, you know, is, is the reality, right? Oh, by the way, I think I actually forgot to mention this. So over a year ago, the UN had claimed that 1 million people are in these camps. Then that number increased to 1.5 million. Experts, then researchers, said that the number is up to 1.5 million. But now Uyghur activists and other scholars kind of estimate that the number is far greater. If they're not in the camps, they're actually in prison. So they say around 3 to 5 million. But we're going to use 1.5 million 
for the sake of this uh, example, but if we take her statistic, if there's 9 out of 68 women dying in a cell, let's say there's 1.5 million people in these camps, then in a span of three months, around 198,000 people are dying, and this does not include children. And one may argue that this is like such a weak argument to make because the sample size is so small, it looks like that's not proper statistics. Um, but the problem is we don't have much other information. Like if we had other numbers, great, we would use that. But this is all we know, and this is all we can estimate. And these numbers are also kind of correlating much to what we are also hearing about the number of people who are coming out of these camps either dead or coming out of these camps to the point where um, they are then hospitalized and die just a few days later. And, these are, and we have real accounts in our community of that happening. So one way China is also trying to wipe out this nation is through those who are influencing society the most, oftentimes in the most positive ways. So we have one of the, um, we have like such prominent academics and, and uh, influencers in our society who are now being sentenced to death. So for example, we have the president of the Xinjiang University. So imagine like the president of UC Berkeley basically being sentenced to death. The president, uh, the head of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region Department of Education, uh, Satar Saud, death sentence as well. You have the president of the Xinjiang Medical University, also sentenced to death, and um, a, prof um, a very famous professor and writer and lecturer, um, sentenced to life in prison. This is Abdujan uh, Ayub. He is kind of like the Uyghur Justin Bieber. A lot of his pop songs have actually. Um, you, you would see him incorporate like Chinese, uh, Ch the Chinese language, Uyghur language, oftentimes as an attempt to bridge, to kind of create bridges between Hutnik Han Chinese and Uyghur people. Even with that kind of effort, he was still, um, we, we believe he's been sent to a camp. He disappeared on February 15th, 2018. Um, and to, to this day, we don't know where he is, whether or not he's alive or dead. And because of this mass incarceration that we see, a lot of what should be very busy streets and areas of, uh, of trade or areas of just socializing like this bazaar, what is supposed to be a very famous bazaar here, is now completely emptied out. So it's oftentimes when you're walking through these streets, people who have gone in as either journalists or tour tourists um, go in and they notice that it's like a ghost town. People are all gone from the streets to the point where now even uh, the town that I mentioned to you guys earlier, Kashgar, um, this was um, a tweet reported by, um, a tweet given out by a reporter um, based in China, and uh, this was in 2018. She said that the resident said that 70 to 80 percent of the resident, I mean, 70 to 80 percent of those living in Kashgar are all gone, or they're in some form of detention. Later on, we we had heard that that number increased around 90 percent. So when you walk through this town, this is actually where my dad had grew up. It's completely empty, and it's like a ghost town. And so one way China is trying to erase the evidence of bodies coming out of these camps and also to subvert the Islamic tradition is by actually cremating bodies. So there was actually evidence uh, shown of the amount of cremation facilities that were built in order to burn all these dead bodies and not um, have to deal with the whole like burial process because, again, that costs a lot of money, that takes a lot of space, and China just doesn't feel like carrying out such a task. And recently, this is a recent report that um, China, and they were showing evidence of graveyards completely being wiped out and destroyed, and China build, building parking lots and parks over these graveyards. So the question is, what happens to the children of these detainees? Right? If there's over 1.5 million people in these camps, let's use that number, right? What are happening to all the children? If these detainees cannot leave the facilities at the end of the day, if they're really being educated, why can't they go home, right? This should be school. They should be able to go home to their families. But no, they're being stuck in these facilities. So the children are then forced to, are then sent to um, what China calls as kindergartens. So like daycares, preschools. Um, they're essentially orphanages. Um, uh, or they call them, or and they call them orphanages while their parents are still alive in these camps. Um, and in these, in these orphanage, orphanages, kindergartens, whatever you want to call them, uh, the children are also forced to undergo something similar to what their parents are going through in terms of being, um, like of trying to, of, in terms of being, in terms of 
trying to be assimilated into Han culture. So these children are not allowed to speak their language in these facilities. They're being subject to abuse and torture. Obviously, familial separation is inducing uh, like generation-long trauma upon them. Um, uh, they're basically uh, forced to basically renounce their Uyghur identity and not and, and um, kind of talk about how their religion or how their identity is a shame, and and that the Chinese, the Han Chinese like identity is the identity that they should be having. So this is a picture of how Uyghur kids would be if they're wearing some of our uh, traditional dresses, right? I think they're about to. These two kids are about to perform and dance, uh, do an Uyghur dance, and this is now how they are forced to dress. Um, forced to wear like this Confucian clothing, which by the way, even Han Chinese kids don't have to do. So this is just an example of the type of forced assimilation that you see of Uyghur children taking place. And then, if you're not in one of these camps, it doesn't mean you're like free and like you're, you're fine. Um, outside of these camps, life is, I would say, no better in the sense that you're living in an open air prison. So there is a massive surveillance state that I'll explain to you in just a bit, but there's also a crackdown on your basic freedoms. And because majority of Uyghurs identify and other Turkic Muslims identify as Muslim, practicing Islam is completely forbidden. Um, and again, this is China, and China claims that this is an attempt to kind of get rid of the potential source of extremism or terrorism. So praying is saying is banned, fasting is banned, saying assalamu alaikum is banned, Wearing hijab or the beard is banned. Naming your baby an Islamic name. When I say Islamic name, I mean like, you know, traditional Muslim names that we hear, like Muhammad, Fatima, Medina. All those names are banned. And if you already have that name and you're like an adult, you're then forced to change that to a traditional Chinese name. Uh, the Islamic funeral traditions are banned. Only a Quran are banned, etc., etc. And so this is our, these are just, some, uh, just a few of countless examples that have come out of people being uh, punished for any sign of religious activity that they were involved in. So this man was sentenced, um, was jailed because he had a Quran recitation on his phone. Um, and by the way, you may ask, okay, how did they find out? It's because China, like because of the massive surveillance technologies, they have figured out ways to confiscate phones or make them download apps on their phones that basically detect all the material on your phone. This woman was handed a 10-year prison sentence because she was encouraging her friend to wear the headscarf. One Uyghur man was sentenced to six years of prison for refusing to shave his beard. This famous philanthropist, his name is Abdul Ghafur Abdul Rasul, was sentenced to death for an unsanctioned Hajj trip. For those who don't know, Hajj is the pilgrimage that Muslims uh, make one, at least once in their lifetime, and it's actually considered an obligation. Um, he had went on Hajj, and as a result, was sentenced to death. And they also actually imprisoned his family as well, uh, killed one of his family members, I believe it's his wife, and also uh, seized one million dollars, over one million dollars of his assets. And then you also have destruction of religious sites. So this is a picture of the inside of a mosque that was turned into a bar. And then our masjids are also being demolished. Our mosques are also being demolished uh, to the ground. This is a mosque in Turpan that was destroyed in October of 2017. Another mosque that was also destroyed. And then you also have, you know, I said um, wearing hijab is banned, wearing niqab is banned. But also it's come to the point where even crack, like if you are shown to be modest in any way, so if you're wearing like a long shirt, um, they, they here you have like Communist Party officials coming with scissors and literally cutting off your dress. Okay. And then another way to get rid of the next generation of Uyghur has been to force Uyghur women to marry ethnic Han Chinese men. And we have evidence of this through pictures posted on Chinese social media. This is actually a picture of a com what is called like a communal marriage where they just kind of marry off multiple couples at once. Um, here you can see the Uyghur woman wearing a traditional Chinese dress rather than like the dress that an Uyghur woman would normally wear. It's probably like the white dress. Um, yeah. 
And they actually, um, one of our local activists, he's actually based in Southern California. He gets a lot of on-the-ground information about what's happening. Um, people actually call him and tell him, risk your lives to tell him some of the information, or tell him the, some of the information of the situation. And he had actually mentioned that now the camps have built offices so that Han Chinese men can go into these camps and basically pick out Uyghur wives. And I mentioned before that this is like an open-air prison. So in the last two years, the state has invested $72.0 billion in techno security in East Turkestan. Let's say you're in Uyghur and you want to go to the grocery store. You walk out of your home and you're more than more, most likely going to be crossing through multiple checkpoints. So before you enter a grocery store, you're going to have to go through. Um, there's actually two lanes, one lane for those who are ethnically Han and another lane if you're Uyghur or Turkic. So if you're a Turkic, you're in this line, you're subject to um, padding, like facial recognition, you're, you're subject to just co complete interrogation, you have to submit your ID card, um, and it's a huge hassle for you to go out and just run an errand. If you're ethnically Han Chinese, you just kind of walk through this, the line with no interrogation, nothing, no security um, checks. And there's, um, China has built facial recognition technologies that actually can actually recognize your face from afar. And you'll see like pictures of security cameras, and I'll show you guys in a bit of what that looks like. Um, mandatory GPS devices in your car. Um, and also mandatory collection of DNA samples, retina scans, and voice prints of laborers. So a lot of detainees, one of the first things that they do when they're detained is they actually take their blood forcibly, and they take them to retract their DNA and um, other very, very, um, What's the right word to use? Personal and information that you don't just like give out to the public or to a state like that. So here's a graph showing the number of new security facilities that were detected in East Turkestan from 2011 to 2018. You can see the significant increase in this number in 2017 and 2018. And then here's a picture showing the area of these new security facilities being uh, expanded at a, at a wide uh, range in 2017 and 2018. Here's a picture of, um, so the left is a picture of a outside of a masjid. You can see the security cameras that are lined up there and then inside of a masjid as well. This is a famous mosque in Qashqar, um, the town that I kept mentioning earlier to you. Um, it's around eight centuries old, I believe. And um, it's a place where thousands of worshipers worship every day, especially on Juma prayer. This is the type of crowd that you would normally see, and the kind of bazaars and, and, and the kind of uh, civilization that you see here. That was a normal. That was kind of the normal life of Uyghurs living in this town, and this is how the the mosque is today, with uh, that whole area completely emptied out. People are not allowed to freely pray in it. Um, and there's, you know, you have like Chinese officers patrolling through the area. And then this is the inside of the mosque, where now the mihrab, or where people have to bow down to, typically, you know, we don't, you, it's not considered sacred for you to have pictures of humans up in the masjid. Um, but here, the Chinese state puts up a picture of the Chinese president Xi Jinping shaking hands with an Uyghur, uh, an Uyghur imam. And um, so when you make sujood, you make sure to make sujood to uh, President Xi instead of God. So this is another way to kind of shift your loyalty from your God to President Xi Jinping. How many of you guys have read 1984? Okay. Well, that's good. Um, so this scene, I, I remember seeing this photo and I immediately thought of 1984. Like it just like, like of, of kind of these huge projections of what is supposed to be you know, your big brother or, or your quote-unquote leader, right? This is a, um, a scene of Xi Jinping being broadcasted in Qashqar. And one of the reporters covering tech in Asia, Paul Moser, talked about, uh, he mentioned, at least this was his quote, he said, at the moment, Qashqar is a surreal and scary place, an unending montage of the same five propaganda shots of Xi Jinping beamed from screens, powerful cameras with GPUs and shining barbed wire accent shabby public facilities. And the, right this, the picture of the right is actually right in front of the Eidgah Mosque that I just showed you guys. And people now describe it as like a ghost town. There's no sign of uh, people uh, kind of freely walking around. And going back to surveillance, right? One way that they actually surveil the people is not only outside, but they make sure that you're 
not doing any of these things that I mentioned inside your homes. And it's one of the things that they did, and the Chinese government actually admitted this, is they sent 1.2 million Han government officials to live inside Uyghur homes to make sure they're not engaging in religion and to assess their political views. And they're actually encouraged to sleep in the same bed as them. So um, here's a picture of one of these so-called, and what China calls this as, they call it like a, as a, they call it relative unity. Like they want to, they want to promote unity between the two ethnicities, Uyghurs and Han Chinese. They're like, oh, this is a way for you guys to like basically become friends and you know, we can all live happily ever after and so on. Um, but in the meantime, these, these uh, Chinese officials actually end up reporting to the government about how they live their life. Um, and sometimes they would actually ask you specific questions just to see your views on certain things. So one of the things that they actually mention is sometimes they would like, offer you a cigarette and see how you um, respond to that. So if you flinch or you say, no, 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 I'm good, that's a sign of potential religious extremism and for you to be sent to a camp. And like I mentioned before, there's mass transportation of Uyghurs to main parts of mainland China. And I kind of just want to shed light on like, you know, instances in history where stuff like this has happened. And this has happened to the Jews in the 1940s. And we saw their fate. So I'm kind of closing off with a kind of description of what's happening. I'm probably leaving out a lot, but I think you guys kind of get a gist of the extent of all of this. But the question is, why is this all happening? Right? And a lot of times people will say, oh, it's because they're Muslim, right? It's just because they're Muslim, they're Islamophobic, they're trying to get rid of terrorism, which to a certain extent is true. But we would argue that it's much more than that. Because if it was really about religion, um, I would say that this, that this clamp up, would, uh, this crackdown would have been, it, to this extent, would have started much earlier. But because of the US's launch on, global, on the global war on terror after 9-11, and, and how the rest of a lot of these other nations have quote unquote dealt with terrorism, China is now using this as an excuse to be like, oh, we're also dealing with our own terrorism problems, right? And I would say that this is kind of China's attempt to wipe out a nation because we're in occupied territory. Because that this, is, this is an issue about land, it's an issue about using our natural resources, it's an issue about basically, basically being able to migrate um, millions upon millions of Han Chinese into our region and basically carry out this modern day occupation that a lot of people don't know about. So this is about territory and it's about economics as well. So, and th that's one thing I want to clarify with you all is that this is not about religion necessarily because you actually have secular Uyghurs who don't even, you know, obviously there's Uyghurs who don't pray, who don't really care about religion. There's even people who don't identify with any religion who are also being subject to the same type of crackdown. But again, this is just an excuse that China is using to basically um, to carry out what they're doing. Have you, have you guys heard of the One Belt, One Road initiative? Who has heard of it? Okay, who hasn't heard of it? Okay. So this is like a key word that you should know. The One Belt, One Road Initiative is essentially a um, multi-trillion dollar initiative that was started in 2013 by President Xi Jinping. And essentially, do you want, does anyone want to explain it? Yes. Yeah, so it's basically President Xi's flagship project. Um, he wants to unite the entirety of Eurasia, Africa, and Southeast Asia, and make China the center of global trade which sounds good, it sounds like it's a bunch of multilateral nation states collaborating, but in the process, obviously, Xinjiang is right, uh, sorry, East Turkestan is right in the middle of that, so then it's just like, oh, you got all these people that are quote unquote in the way, and it's the One Belt, One Road initiative is the excuse that yeah. this is all happening on there. So one thing China claims is that this is a, and this is their exact words, they actually say that this is promoting friendship between China and another country. It's like, this is our way of becoming best friends. And they've actually been, I would say, successfully enacting that upon other countries. So Pakistan is one of them. Uh, Pakistan right now is in huge debt to China. And because of that, you're actually starting to see mass migration of Han Chinese into parts of Pakistan. Um, and people are starting to see this as a slow type of colonialism into their country. And people are kind of waking up and being like, okay, what's happening? Um, parts of Africa, there are actually uh, numerous, uh, even African women who are, who are marrying off to, or being married off to Chinese men to conduct this business that's occurring there. 
Um, parts of Central Asia are, many countries in Central Asia are also in debt to China. Even Turkey right now has been on board with this initiative. And as you can see, much of it actually goes through East Turkestan, which is why our land is so, so critical for China. That's why an independent state, reestablishing an independent state is such a big threat for China. And that's why they're like, oh my God, these people are terrorists. If they end up establishing, reestablishing the independent state, we're not going to have access to this land. It's going to be a big no-no, and it's not going to help us with this whole project that we have. And so this whole thing kind of comprises of pipelines, uh, railroads, and so on. And I would say this is one of the ma biggest reasons why a lot of the countries nowadays are silent on this issue. And you're wondering why Muslim-majority countries, people are saying, why, aren't the, why isn't the Muslim Ummah standing up? It's because of this reason. Um, they're in debt to China, and they, are, they think that speaking up against China will uh, jeopardize their ability to conduct their business with China. And it's a fortunate reality. And I mean, it's like, you know, this is basically blood money, right? Like, these people are being slaughtered and put into these concentration camps while everyone else is just remaining silent. And they know what's happening. They know it. Okay, and so I'm going to jump right into... I mean, I think it's pretty obvious what the people of East Turkestan want. Obviously, they're going to want uh, just basic, the basic ability to live freely, to not be so scared of their life, and to walk out of the street without thinking that they're going to be sent to a concentration camp and tortured for the rest of their life. Um, so, but it's more specifically, the demands are we, you know, we ask for these camps to be closed, um, you know, for people to, in, to basically move around freely, to have basic human rights. And many people of East Turkestan are now... Um, or they have been basically wanting to establish, reestablish the independent state. And I'm saying reestablish for a reason because we have had our own independence before. We have had our own nation before. We have had our own republics before. And because of that, the Uyghur Christian people of East Turkestan have the right to want to seek that as well. And so China, oftentimes, they call us separatists. And I would say using the term separatist, and I would say even the media uses that term, is very problematic because it implies that we've always been a part of the Chinese state, which is not true. So that's one thing we're trying to erase from like, the narrative that's being, that's being brought out to the world. Like, oh, these Uyghurs are like potential separatists and therefore they're potential terrorists. Um, basically, China equates three terms to each other. They, they equate terrorism, separatism, and, um, and extremism. Those are the three terms that they um, equate to each other. And we also are demanding the government that um, China allows for journalists and people to freely enter the country to investigate the, um, to basically investigate the human rights abuses occurring. Yes? Uh, do I have permission to take a picture of these? Yeah, of course. Please, you guys can feel free to take a picture of whatever. And furthermore, allow for Uyghurs living abroad to have direct contact with their relatives back home. Because right now, even though we have these phones that we use every day of our lives, we're able to FaceTime our loved ones whenever we want, we cannot do that. We can't even call them without the risk of them being put into a camp or prison because we called. So for me, I haven't, I haven't spoke to my aunt or uncles or cousins living there for years now. And I know that if I were to do that, that's, I'm, I'm basically like sentencing them to their death. And obviously, I mean, we're not going to want that. Um, but... Alhamdulillah, I have my parents, my direct, my siblings here, but I have a lot of friends right now who have no contact with their parents back home and are terrified to even make a phone call to know if they're okay because China is monitoring all of these calls and punishing, for doing, punish, punishing them for doing so. And we also want the international leaders to use the, uh, what's called the Global Magnitsky Act to sanction the Chinese officials for their crimes. Uh, so one way that obviously genocide kind of makes its way and allows and kind of just got to get swept under the rug is through the fact that these leaders are not held accountable for their crimes. And so, so this act is essentially uh, made to try to uh, hold them accountable for their actions. Okay, so now I'm going to get to the part where I say how you can help. And again, after this, I'm going to open up for Q&A because you guys may have questions about what I've been talking about. But I would say the first way that you can help, well, the first of all, for you guys being here is already one step that you guys are um, completing. Um, one of my biggest um, things that I mentioned is obviously raising awareness, right? But you first have to learn about the situation in order to raise awareness. But uh, one thing I want to say is you guys are college students, university students. Make use of university. And you guys have already done this by organizing this event, using your university's resources and money to create an event like this, right? Um, but it's not only just creating an event and raising awareness. Analyze or uh, um, 
figure out your university's relationship with China. Because I would say most American universities, elite universities, have such strong Chinese uh, relationship with China that uh, to the point where this university is probably willing to be complicit in this genocide by being silent. And I'm giving a specific example. For example, I just graduated from Duke in May, and Duke actually has a whole campus operating in, um, in China. It's called the Duke Kunshan University. We had, uh, I had organized an event on campus similar to this one, and, um, and it was on the Chronicle, uh, it was on our newspaper, and we actually had asked the Duke administration to give a few comments, or to kind of comment on this, right? Be like, what do you guys think, given that Duke has this campus running in China and that Duke hasn't said anything or done anything? They declined to comment. Again, that was a sign that Duke was complicit. And I was like, this is so, so frustrating. And I'm kind, I kind of regret during my time that I wasn't able to do much, that I wasn't able to reach out to the administration directly and be like, hey, like, you guys are literally like helping a genocide. And 50 years from now, when you were writing history textbooks and we talk about the genocide of Uyghurs, we don't want to be talking about how Duke is complicit, right? Another example, um, I'm kind of going to, sorry, I'm going to switch, I'm kind of going to, switch really quick. But another example of this university that's complicit is MIT. MIT has partnered with three technology, Chinese technology companies that uh, basically are in charge of surveilling, are, are a big reason why the Uyghurs are surveilled. So for example, iFlyTech is a company that um, specializes in, in voice recognition. This voice of recognition is then used upon the Uyghur population. That is then a big reason why these people are being rounded up into camps. Another one, a huge one, is Oh, I'm not sure how to say this. Huawei. 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 Yeah. Huawei. Yes. Um, they have a partnership with the Ministry of Public Security in the East Turkestan region, and um, MIT has research. Or sorry, the Huawei has research deals with over 50 U.S. universities, and uh, MIT actually says it's not going to renew its current partnerships, but um, they will revisit collaboration as circumstances dictate. There's another a company called SenseTime, and this is uh, in charge of um, uh, kind of multiple platforms. They, they do facial recognition, video analysis, text recognition um, against uh, its citizens. So China, MIT has partnered with three of these companies, and we're all here in the United States. And so one of the campaigns that my organization and uh, everyone that we're calling for is to actually hashtag stop MIT, call the president, uh, call the administration there, and really shame them for what they're doing. And say, you are complicit in genocide. Don't be, you don't need to like kind of beat around the bush and maybe use simpler terms. That's essentially what it is. And we have direct evidence of that as well. Um, so yeah, going back to the campus discussion. Um, so I would say analyze your, you, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with UC Davis, unfortunately. It's my first time here. But I'm assuming that, honestly, I would say my prediction is that UC Davis has a strong relationship with China. Um, whether if it, sometimes it has like a Confucius Institute, a Chinese Institute, I would look into that and figure out, um, you know, what what uh, UC Davis has been doing in terms of that. Even reaching out, do you guys have like an East Asian department? Yeah. Right. That's a big department that you can target. You can talk to, talk to professors there, and be like, hey, why aren't we learning about this whole situation? Right. Perhaps you guys have. Has anyone like ever talked? Like it's has anyone ever taken a class where this has been mentioned? Maybe once or twice. Oh, I mean human rights class. Oh, he's a human rights class. But anyone else? Okay, one person. Okay, but you see how that's a problem, right? This is not being talked about, right? Even in the, the course catalog, when you're finding, uh, if you want to learn more about certain civilizations, this is not talked about. That's also probably that's possibly um, a big reason is possibly because there aren't uh, a. Uh, enough professors to be able to talk on this issue because you need someone uh, educated and, and scholarly to be able to teach a course. But that's just an example, right? Reach out to your East Asian department and talk about you know, this problem right here and how this department could also be complicit as well. Okay, and so another thing is uh, obviously you can mobilize and organize protests in your local communities to pressure bodies to take action against China's action. That's like the most basic one. Um, but I would say one of the biggest ones right now is actually to so we have something called the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, and this act was introduced to Congress last year. And um, essentially, this act, if passed, if made into a bill, will essentially sanction the Chinese officials for their crimes, um, and what they're going to demand the release of the people from these camps and ensure basic uh, human rights and freedoms. Also, ensure contact with Uyghurs abroad, 
um, and with their relatives back home. And there's also much more demands in there. But, it's a, but essentially, um, recently the Senate has passed, has passed it, right? But we need the House to do it as well. And so that's where we need your help. So uh, we need you to call your representatives to support the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. If your representative already has pa like supported it, you can find another representative and easily reach out to them. And I'm going to make this task easy for you guys. You don't guys have to do your research. There's a website that you guys can go to called saveuyghur.org. So it's essentially, it's spelled this way. There's obviously no space in between the words. But if you go to this website, there's going to be an action tab, take action, where it's going to literally lead you to a place where you can just click a button and immediately calls for you or it's, it sends an email for you so you don't have to do any work perhaps you can you know if you want to customize the message you can but that's all you got to do literally it's two, two minutes every time and tell other people to do people to do it as well another way that you can help um uh, so another one is that we say call or write the, to the white house to ask the president to sign the Uyghur human rights policy act after it is passed and if you are from outside the U.S., you can call or write to your parliament or congress to urge action as well. Um, okay, and then one last thing. So people are also talking about what if we boycott China, right? And this is such a big question because China, almost everything is made in China. I'm pretty sure all of us here are, made in, are wearing something that's made in China, including myself, right? Like, this is a big problem because... Because of this, we're enabling uh, China to continue their business throughout the world and kind of get away with what they're doing. Um, so one of our recent campaigns, as it was actually uh, launched during Ramadan, where we said, not only are you going to fast from food and water, but let's actually fast from China by not buying stuff made from them. So every time we'd go to the store, it was, it was actually very, very hard. Like, I'd have to go look at the tab, uh, tag and find something that wasn't made in China. And it's a challenge, but that's why we made a campaign like this to say, hey, let's try this and, and um, you know, boycott this genocidal state from now on. So, and one thing that has recently developed or like um, has been known is that now these, fact, these concentration camps have built factories where people are being, when they are quote unquote released from these camps, they're being forced to work in these factories as modern day slaves. So oftentimes they're not paid, or even if they're paid, they're paid like very, very, very little. Um, and they're not allowed to be released from these factories oftentimes. So there's modern day slaves that are making our clothes. And actually last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, my organization, Sound Vision, we had, and Justice for All, we had uh, organized a few protests around Costco. You guys shop at Costco? Right, Costco, I loved Costco growing up. Like I love their free samples. I, I still like to shop there. But it had recently been figured out that they were actually um, partnering with one of the companies in China that actually use modern day Uyghur slaves. And we found out that they had shelved hundreds of thousands of baby pajamas in the Costco that were made from these slaves. And um, this campaign was, you know, we had reached out to the Costco corporate and we said, shame on you, right? Like you guys need to do your research before you partner with these companies. They immediately took off these places from their shelves. And, um, and, and responded to that. So that's an example, right? Like our, the da daily things that we purchase, we could, be da we could be complicit in that as well. Target and Cotton On, this was, a, uh, this was news from today actually. Target and Cotton On was actually for the longest time using cotton that was manufactured and made in Sh um, East Turkestan. Um, oftentimes these clothes were actually made by these slaves and they actually finally released a statement saying that they are no longer doing business with companies in, Xinjiang, um, in East Turkestan and um, you know, targeting cotton on basically said we're not going to use cotton from there anymore. So that's a good development, right? That's, that's some progress. So uh, to close, um, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm wondering if you guys have any ideas of things that you guys also want to do, but I don't want to go on from here. I want you guys to grab your pizza, have some time to kind of like, you know, decompress, and then we can go on to Q and A. Allah. Thank you. I'm Aiden. Oh my god. I gotta go to Yes. I, so, so, 
I'll go for it. So, so, um, we're okay. Okay. Um, yeah, but I think we should keep it for the live stream in case people um, want it. Oh, no, is it okay if I announce that we're going to break the pizza? Oh, yeah, yeah. If that's okay, real quick. Okay. Uh, okay, guys, um, we're going to break for pizza and then we'll come back in 10 minutes for QA. Alright? As you know, there's been like a shift in the press regarding the home. That got released since she lives in Virginia. Yeah, she lives in Fairfax, Virginia right now. With <laughs> so she, because she was a citizen of Egypt, Egypt basically vouched for her release. He said, you're detaining one of our people, and if you don't release her now, you're going to face consequences. So because of her citizenship with Egypt, that allowed her to um, be free. And her kids were also Egyptian, I mean, had Egyptian citizenship as well. Yes. So, so along that logic, if the U.S. actually had some guts and sort of like unequivocally stood up like that, it would have like... Right. So I would say that the U.S. does have, have has had done some uh, recent, has made recent steps. For example, Secretary Mike Pompeo, um, uh, just recently, I think it was a little over a week ago, he had announced that they're, they're enacting visa restrictions on Chinese government officials or Ch Communist Party officials who are complicit in these uh, crimes against humanity. So that was a big step forward, right. and I think that affected a lot of um, people in the region as well. So, and yes? Do you know if like, any international measures or like, any form of like, legislation almost from other countries other than the U.S. that are like targeting the Chinese? Uh, right. So, okay, honestly, I don't know specific legislation off the top of my head because I would say most of these countries that we're thinking of are actually not doing anything about it or have been silent on this issue, which is the unfortunate reality. I would say most of the countries that are actually stepping up are mostly Western countries. And you would say that maybe because of the trade war between U.S. and China, that the U.S. is basically using this as an excuse to kind of step up and bash China any way that they can, even if it means quote-unquote, vouching for the rights of Muslims in East Turkestan, even though our Trump administration, like, hates Muslims here, right? Like, it's obviously ironic, but, you know, we're taking it as, as, we're taking it as is and accepting that help that we can get from at least the U.S. government. But in terms of specific legislation of other countries, um, I'm, I don't know if any, anything off the top of my head. I have to do some research on that. Anyone else? Yes? Ties with the China's campus there. And yeah. how do they go about doing that? Um, so she's talking about, um, she had heard me talk about how Cornell University actually had a Confucius Institute and China had decided to cut off ties with these institutes. Um, so I actually don't know that many details about it. All I had heard was that they were more concerned about the academic freedoms that were involved because I think uh, the people who were involved in these discussions were not allowed to criticize the Chinese government because of the ties with the Confucius Institute. And so China, the, the Cornell had decided just to be like, this is unacceptable, you know, we're being complicit in these human rights abuses just by being silent and forced to kind of paint a happy picture of China. That's all the knowledge that I have on that case. But I'm sure you can look it up and see more about um, China kind of ruling off that. But I don't think they actually mentioned East Turkestan in their statement. This is more about academic freedoms and just general human rights. Um, I don't think they ever mentioned like the fact that they would be complicit in genocide if they had remained silent. Anyone else? Comments? Thoughts? Yes? Uh, I know you had mentioned earlier how like, there's people from like, East Turkestan region that would visit relatives <laughs> Right. Just by curiosity, like, why were they allowed to, if, if they were punished for coming back to the countries, mm -hmm. what kind of allowed them to leave? What allowed them to leave in the first place? That's a good question. So, I mean, I would say, like, I mean, now it's, like, really, really hard for people to leave the country. Like, people, people's passports have been, millions of passports in East Turkestan have been confiscated, including my own cousin's. He's 12 years old. And because of that, he's not able to join his, the rest of his family here in the United States. Um, his mom is staying with him just so he's not alone. But because of the Chinese government's confiscation of his passport, he's just stuck, he's stuck there. And his siblings are actually here in California and his father. Um, but so right now, it's really, really hard to actually leave the country if you don't have possi um, proper documentation that hasn't been confiscated. But for those who are able to travel abroad, um, 
people have done it through different routes. Sometimes they're actually like granted visas uh, out of luck. Sometimes you actually have passports. A lot of times people leave the country through bribery, unfortunately. You know, there's, it's, the corruption level is so high. I know a lot of Uyghur refugees who are actually able to sn basically sneak out of the country as refugees. They weren't, they weren't traveling, they weren't like going as a traveler, they're actually going to escape. But they had gone through basically bribing uh, officials to basically give them these documents. So anywhere from like 40,000 to 50,000 UN, or it's just numbers in the thousands. That's it's a lot of money that people are, are willing to invest in just to free themselves or free their family members. Um, so, yeah. I mean, so sometimes people are able to leave the country, but it's uh, out of rare instances and um, through certain conditions as well. I don't know if I, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Parties like in the past, in the East Pakistan, and if, like if it existed in the past, uh, do they have any American chapter or European chapter uh, who's been working here? Okay, so right now, um, because again, like I said in my presentation, even saying the term East Turkestan or having our flag or doing anything for a nation for the sake of our nation that results in you know, a death sentence or, you know, life in sentence, whatever it is, um, a lot of the work that has been done has been through diaspora. A lot of the activism is through strictly diaspora. So um, people from the American community, Australian community, uh, European, Central Asian, uh, there's a huge population in Turkey. So there are a lot of organizations out there that are doing this work. Um, there was even the, um, in 2004, the East Turkestan government exile was established here in the U.S., um, and that was, you know, a, some, a big step forward in trying to reestablish the independence of East Turkestan. Um, and there's a lot of, I would say, um, there's also organizations that are, uh, there's one organization called the World Oil Congress, and that's an umbrella organization that uh, kind of expands. It's based in Europe, but it spans the rest of many parts of the world, and it's doing a lot of human rights activism in order to tackle what's going on. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I would say that we're still working on unity. Uh, within the Uyghur community, there's a lot of division, and I hate to say it, and I'm being completely honest, there's a lot of division between the types of approaches on how to deal with the situation. There are some people who are saying we should be openly seeking for independence and we should demand, be demanding that for, because that is our right as an occupied nation. We have the right to um, get our independence back. You know, And the first step for that is to be first recognized as an occupied territory. So that's a lot of the work that we've been doing is um, you know, appealing or like trying to be recognized as an occupied territory, just like Tibet. Um, but and then the other argument is okay. That's not a that's not a safe approach because if we fight for independence, then we're basically uh, kind of doing what the Chinese government is looking for, which is claiming that we are potential quote unquote separatists or people who are prone to terrorism. So instead of saying independence, we should just fight for human rights and let's say, let's just promise that we'll live autonomously, happily with the Chinese. And so that's one of the arguments that are being made. They said let's not use the word independence. Let's just say let's fight for human rights and let's fight for autonomy. But then the other side is like, okay, this human rights discourse is dead because China doesn't even believe in the concept of human rights, right? They believe that this is a Western democratic notion that is just complete bogus and really, like, honestly, fighting for human rights, like, your basic, what China claims is that you're, you're getting involved in their internal affairs, right? So the, independent, the independence group says, like, okay, this is a very dead approach because even when we try to do human rights, look at what China has been doing. China is still doing what they're wanting to do. So the only way to reestablish these human rights in the first place is to have to give the ability for the people of East Turkestan to govern their own land, to govern their own people. Because until then, China China is not gonna is not gonna care. So that's just an example. I, I kind of digress a little bit from your question because I think you were just talking about political parties and you know. But I'm kinda, I was kind of delving into like the uh, complexities of how people have been trying to deal with the situation and, and go about it in a proper manner. Do you have any follow-up questions with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, like, I'm from Pakistan, so we have right. the, like, different political parties and they have very different chapters. So even if like, uh, nobody here from China can contact those political parties, like your organization can, can contact those parties, like uh, all those chapters, like, like Pakistan, Delhi, Pakistan, PPP, 
account like you can contact the American chapters of those parties in the US to like lobby for the cause. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, we have these organizations um, that are doing work that's similar to this. So we have even the organization that I'm coming here as for is Justice for All or Sound Vision, which has been doing a lot of uh, work on the ground to, we have like our law, own lobbying firm that has been basically behind the scenes and trying to get the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act uh, passed as a bill. Um, and so we're, you know, and then we have like, again, like the World Uyghur Congress, even the independence groups that are working on the ground to do stuff. Um, but unfortunately, because again, like, we are not an independent nation. We don't have the people in East Turkestan would love to form these political parties, would love to form their own state of governance, but because they're unable to, uh, unfortunately, there isn't that much access to these kind of uh, um, the access to these means of like basically working together, um, you know, with other countries just yet. But I mean, again, these organizations are the organizations that do exist are doing what it, are doing what it what it can do. Um, so. I think that those are my two cents on that. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, in terms of the the Uyghur Human Right, uh, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, I wanted to ask you if you um, think that it goes far enough, and if it doesn't go far enough, how uh, Americans or or people that are not there can support and pressure the United States government to do more to... Um, well, I will say that in comparison to other countries... So did everyone hear his question? Yeah. Okay, so I would say that in comparison to other countries, the U.S. is probably doing one of the most okay. in regards to this. Um, in terms of, like, if you look at the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, look it up online, you'll see the list, how comprehensive it is. So I will say that it, it's pretty impressive, and we're, we're grateful for that kind of initiative. Um, but obviously, I mean, even let's say, every, let's say everything in that list is completed. Let's say they release people from the camps, you know, like, the religious freedoms are, like, come, they come back to life, which honestly is a very dull prospect, given what we see in, uh, in other parts of China, or even Hong Kong nowadays, right? Like, it's... But let's say even that happens, there's still a, a um, there's still a need for, for example, people are still going to be seeking independence, right. right? Because these human rights, we believe that these human rights are never going to be fully enacted until people have the own ability to govern their own land and govern their own people, right? So I, I would say that it's not. And so one of the things that these or, a lot of these independence groups and the indep people who are seeking independence are saying is that, like, we want the United States and the rest of the world to recognize us as an occupied territory and support our independence. Because other, until then, like, this is all just a, a game and a joke, and China is not going to do anything that we're saying. So, so the Security Council to, to recommend it as, as a... Yeah, so we want, yeah, the yeah. U.S. Security Council, we want them to recognize right. that as an occupied territory, because right. that's the very first step in being right. able to, um, like, even under international law, yeah. once you're... Uh, recognized as an occupied territory, you're then allowed to, um, you have the right to self-defense, right? So in that scenario, you're allowed to uh, fight back in a sense, right? So, so that's important to keep in mind. But right now, because we're considered like ethnic minorities and indigenous peoples, like, you know, we're not, we're not given that kind of status. Um, and that's why I think I don't, I, I think I forgot to mention actually that calling us ethnic minorities also negates us as a population. And I would encourage people not to call Uyghurs ethnic minorities because it takes away from the fact that we've been majority, we've been the majority people in our homeland for centuries before being occupied. It's almost similar to calling Palestinians ethnic minorities within Palestine, or even calling us Chinese Muslims is like, is is honestly it's cringeworthy because again that's like calling Palestinian Muslims Israeli Muslims, right? Like, it's you're. It's kind of negating like our whole identity as a nation, as a Turkic people. People then think we're actually Chinese. They think we're just Muslims in China that have been living there forever. And all of a sudden, China wants to crack down on us. You know, it kind of negates that whole history. So we encourage people to avoid using the term Chinese Muslims and ethnic minorities when they're going about this issue. Um, instead, you can say the term, you know, Uyghurs and other Turkic people. You can say the people of East Turkestan. I would say that's probably a better term that you could use that encompasses everyone. Um, but please do avoid using the term Chinese Muslims. Um, yeah, yeah, he has yeah. his hand. Yes? Um, I was what's the process of like, getting considered to be an How do you get that? Okay. 
This is a tough question. I, I don't know. I don't want to give specifics because I'm not going to say pretend like I know something specifically. But the, I would say that the, one of the biggest steps is first, well, the public knowledge of it being an occupied state, but also like even um, under international law, like first explaining like the history and, and like how this actually came about, right? How come, you know, Tibet is recognized as an occupied state, but how come we're not? And let's look at the history. And if we're not recognizing that aspect, then there's something clearly wrong with the way that we're being portrayed as and the way that our history is being told, right? So that I would say the number one approach is like what I said, I had that slide of the history. That stuff needs to be recapped multiple times. It needs to be looked into. It needs to be, uh, you know, rehashed multiple times to uh, like different human rights groups, NGOs, international, um, international law entities, and so on. And hopefully from there we can see some results. Okay, yes? This is more like a specific uh, question about like the way your like, culture. Right. But what's the you said in the Turkic language you guys speak, what is it called? It's called it's called the Uyghur language. So so I'll I'll say something in Uyghur Chish for you guys. Um, I'll be like you know Assalamu alaikum. Well, that's actually Arabic, but you know we say Assalamu alaikum because we're Muslim. Assalamu alaikum. Yaxin says, "Bugun dars uqdunuz mu?" Like, did you study today? Kanchi um, ashkirdanes. All right. This is like, how old are you? Um, some of the words, if I speak more and more, you'll start to hear a lot of words that sound like like a lot like Turkish because um, we're a Turkish language. Um, my name is actually, Aydin, is um, a name that is actually widely used in Turkey. It's actually a guy's name, unfortunately. But um, in East Turkestan, it's a, it's a unisex name, and it means the same thing. It essentially means illuminated or like moonlight. Ay means moon. Our numbers are bir, iki, üç, tört, beş, altı, yette, sekiz, dokuz, on. That's one through ten. In Turkish, it's bir, iki, üç, tört, beş, altı, yette, sekiz, dokuz, on. Right? You see the, the, the similarities, right? Um, the, a lot of the grammar and the words are, are like they come together. So I I took a few semesters of Turkish in college, and easy, learning it was probably one of the easy, it was actually very easy for me to pick up on the learning process. Um, also, our script is actually in Arabic, so it's actually it looks very similar to the, the Persian, the Farsi script. Um, so that's another thing that China is erasing. You won't see our Uyghur script all, um, in our public areas and our streets and shops and everything because it's all being taken down in that sense. Um, but, yeah. And also, there's an Uyghur restaurant. There are actually Uyghur restaurants in the Bay Area you guys should check out. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys have ever had Uyghur food, but whenever I take my friends, they like really love it because um, they actually combine a lot of the spices and, and flavors from, because it's like the center of the Silk Road. Uh, there's a lot of influences from central, nearby Central Asian countries, um, and uh, I would say that it's something you guys should definitely try. There's actually one in San Francisco that I went to last night. It's called uh, Sama, S-A-M-A. You guys should check it out. So. Yes. Okay. I guess that's it. Thank you guys so much for everything.